welcome from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational church at the crossroads of life. We bring you portions of the Sunday morning service from our beautiful sanctuary at 303 South Peck Avenue in the community of Manhattan Beach. We are glad you are joining us for this special service, and we hope it will be a source of inspiration and direction for you in the days ahead. We also invite you to join us in person this coming Sunday morning or any Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. For more information about the church and its wide-ranging programs, please feel free to contact the church office at 310-372-3587. And now, our Sunday morning service.
Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the bottle groves and the mome grass outgrabe. I have no idea what those words mean. <laughs> but you'll recognize those opening lines from Lewis Carroll's famous poem, The Jabberwocky. And that's what I think of when I hear about Jacob at the Jabbok. We're more familiar with Jacob in Haran, because that's where one night, as he leaves home, fleeing from the wrath of his brother Esau, he lays down and has his head upon a rock and dreams about angels going up and down a ladder. We've seen that depicted in Sunday school materials. We go to summer camp and we sit around the campfire and we hold hands and sing, We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We may not know what that's all about either. But it's a nice song and on a starry summer night around the campfire it can be a holy moment. But Jacob at the Javok, which comes later, may be closer to our experience as we live life day by day. Here, Jacob wrestles with some strange heavenly being and has one of these life-changing experiences. Now, the Jabbok, as you may or may not know, is a relatively insignificant stream that flows out of what is now the kingdom of Jordan and runs into the Jordan River, which, of course, runs from the Sea of Galilee in the north down to the Dead Sea in the south. And were it not for Jacob's encounter with this angelic being at the Jabbok, we might never have heard of it. We speak of the Jordan River, even today, metaphorically, as a kind of a symbol of a frontier over which we must all cross someday. We sing about crossing the Jordan. <coughs> this final transition between life that is here and life that is to come. But the Jabbok event, as I say, may speak more directly to us as we talk about the daily struggle we have to be the persons God wants us to be or that we ourselves want to be. Jacob, not your ideal role model. The Jewish Christian story begins, of course, with Abraham and his son Isaac and his son, Jacob. Now, Jacob is a little brother who is in trouble from the word go. He's the second twin born to Isaac and Rebekah. And as he's born, he will not even let go of his brother's heel, in the process of birth itself. In so many families, Jacob and Esau are almost opposites. And Jacob plays it to the hilt. Finding his brother, who's an outdoorsman, one day ravished by hunger after hunting all day, comes upon Jacob, who is tending his fire and cooking a pot of wonderful smelling stew. So Esau foolishly trades his father's birthright for a mess of stew. A pretty dumb deal, but... History is full of those. But then, not content with this, Jacob later connives with his mother to disguise himself as Esau, goes into his almost blind father, and gets from him the birthright, the blessing. So now he's got the whole thing for himself. And Esau, when he hears about this, is understandably enraged and simply says something like, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> His mother tells him it would be a good idea to leave the home. So Jacob does. Goes to another country where he will later meet his wives and where he will trick his father-in-law out of the best cattle and herds before heading back toward his homeland. Now, it's on the way to this encounter on the way to the homeland, then he has this encounter about the, uh, the angel wrestling. Now, I have, to, I have some problems with wrestling. Um, 
When I was a child, my brothers and I went with our, my dad and, and mom out to the county fair in Oregon, out of Hillsboro. And in one of the tents, they had a wrestling uh, event. My brothers and I were quite impressed when this carnival wrestler invited anyone to come out of the audience and wrestle with him. And one man did, got it from the audience, <coughs> and climbed to the ring. And the match didn't last very long, but we admired that man's courage. We went back and told my dad, who was checking out the livestock, about this wrestling match, and he said, no, boys, it's all a setup. No, 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 no. This guy came right out of the audience, got in the ring and wrestled with this guy. And we just kept on and on until my dad said, well, let's go see again. We went back into the tent, of course. And the barker made the same pitch. Anybody want to come out of the audience and wrestle this man? Well, the same man, of course, got up. <laughs> <laughs> like he had never seen him before. <laughs> we were so disappointed. Kind of thing Bob was talking about, how your parents get so wise as you grow up. And I never wrestled in school, uh, other than just, you know, roughhousing. I'm amazed if I happen to click on a wrestling match on television. And, uh, I mean, I don't want to be offensive, but people are actually watching this stuff. <laughs> I can't believe it. There's a movie out now. It's up for an Oscar tonight. The Wrestler. I, I don't know whether I want to see it or not. I have a morbid curiosity because in 1981, I did a wedding ceremony for Mickey Rourke. I don't know whether the wedding lasted or not. I haven't heard or seen of him since except through the movies. But he makes strange movies anyway. But it's hard for me to think of wrestling as something other than a staged event. But this encounter with Jacob is the real thing. And while there's some disturbing details in the story, because of the mythic language that's used, there's certainly, I think, some food for thought here that we might think of as we prepare to enter the Lenten season. Jacob, as I say, is kind of a scoundrel. But before... You know how it is when you point a finger at somebody, there's three pointing back at yourself. Well, that's kind of like it is with Jacob. We see something of him in most of us, if not all of us. I mean, who's not a little competitive anyway? Not that we do anything to win, but it sure feels better to win than to lose. John Calhoun had the audacity yesterday to call me immediately after the Washington State UCLA game. <laughs> I said, I don't want to talk to you. He kept right on. <laughs> I had a friend, I have a good friend actually named Jim. He taught me some years ago to play squash. Now squash, if you don't know, is a game kind of like racquetball, except the, the, the handle's longer, the, the head is smaller, and the ball itself is smaller. It's a hard game. Well, I started learning to play the game. And then I started trying to play well enough to give him a good game. And then I started playing well enough to beat him. Now, he is very competitive. And I found that contagious. And winning became important to me. And some days, the competition would become so fierce and so heated that I would literally quit and walk off the court in anger and refuse to play anymore. That's hard to imagine someone as meek and gentle and mild as myself. <laughs> then, of course, I'd have to eat crow and apologize and go back and play some more. But the truly wondrous thing about all of this is that Jim and I remain the best of friends, though we're hundreds of miles apart. We continue to communicate by email and phone and sometimes visit each other. So competition, as some of it, you've heard about Alex Rodriguez, of course, the uh, New York Yankee, who uh, admitted to taking, uh, in, how do we call this, performance enhancing substances. He said, I wanted to prove to everyone 
that I was worth being one of the greatest players of all time. I did take a banned substance, and for that I am very sorry and deeply regretful. I think for the record I should state that John Calhoun and Rabbi Kahin and myself have never taken performance enhancing drugs. <laughs> People have suggested we should. <laughs> but competition. Winning is not everything. I mean, let's face it. But Jacob, it was. He always had to be number one. Always had to get it all. If it took lying and conniving and deceiving and manipulating to get there, then manipulating, that's the other thing. We have something of the manipulator in us as well. So here's the thing. You can't convince your spouse that a few days in Tahiti would be wonderful for everyone. Well, you pick up a travel brochure and leave it lying around here and there. You go out to a Polynesian restaurant for dinner. You buy her a nice muumuu or buy him a nice Aloha shirt. Pretty soon you can manipulate the situation to where you've gone to Tahiti and it was all her idea. We learn that from an early age. How long can the parent resist the angry cries of an infant, even when they know they're just being manipulated? We all do it. Something of Jacob in each one of us. But here's the good news. In this, as in this ancient story. God not only knows all of this about us, but God loves us enough to not settle for what we are, but keeps wrestling with us to become what we yet can be. So in many ways, God comes to challenge us, to encourage us, to prod us into being something more. Maybe it's like a flying leap at some point when you least expect it. Maybe it's just the soft embrace of a parent or a friend. Maybe it's a moment of indescribable beauty when you just gaze in awe at a sunset and feel overwhelmed by the presence of the Creator. Or some haunting theme from a symphony that somehow triggers your tear ducts. Or you stand by the bed of a seriously ill friend and wish that you could do something or say something. And yet you know that somehow in that experience, God himself is there. Or you read a passage of scripture, you've read it many times before, and suddenly you see something you never saw before. It's just wonderful that God does not give up on us and keeps urging us and prodding us and coaxing us to be more than what we are. That's wonderful, but it's not always welcome. I mean, it's one thing to be religious, but you don't want to be a nut. Jacob came away from his wrestling match a wounded soul, literally. It's not too far-fetched to imagine that he, we may be injured if we seriously grapple with the goodness of God. Not that we're going to suffer some physical injury, but certainly our power center may be affected, our super ego, our uh, inflated pride. And that may be some of the reluctance that people have in embracing the Christian faith. I don't know. On the one hand, we're bombarded by pop psychology that says, just believe in yourself and you can do anything you want to do. On the other hand, the experience of people like Paul who says, without Christ, I can't do anything. So if the struggle is real and genuine and lasting, then it may bring a very deep change within us. Jacob was not going to let go of this heavenly being until he received a blessing from God. And we don't know what that blessing was. Comes out limping for the rest of his life. You wonder how much of a blessing that could be. But he is blessed from this point on because he's not the same person. And this is reflected in the change of his name. All right, says this shadowy creature, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. 
Now, this is not like giving up a name like Ichabod or Mortimer. This is God saying, you will no longer be known as the cheat, the deceiver, the supplanter, but Israel, which means he who strives with God and who will become the founder of that great nation with his 12 sons. He would be different, and he'd have to live up to a name like that. I was named after two of my uncles, one on my dad's side and one on my mother's side. And I remember always feeling a special bond between them. When I was around them, I'd watch them. I'd observe their actions and their ways and felt like I had to be like them because I had their name. I don't know how well I lived up to that, but I did feel responsible and honored by those names that were given to me. Names are important. On classic country radio, which on cable is channel 903, you'll still hear Johnny Cash singing about a boy named Sue, the name his father had given him, and the trouble he had with that all his life. I remember marrying a couple down in Texas Bonnie and Freddie Lemon were their names. Not that unusual, except Bonnie is the man and Freddie is the woman. <laughs> and I guess it worked out as far as I know. Maybe they discovered the secret to having a strange name is to marry somebody with a strange name. George Tate. George Tate took over a software company called Vulcan. I'm getting Rick's attention down here. His advertising man said they needed a better term. That's not a very good marketing term. They suggested they call it D-Base 2. Though there was no D-Base 1. It just sounded like there might have been, and this was a better model. <laughs> and it became an instant seller. And the name of the company itself was just as bogus. There was a George Tate. But Ashton Tate is a made-up name. There is no Ashton. Pure fiction. But again, it implies that the company is a merger of two firms, which makes it stronger, you see. George Tate died not long after that merger took place. No living person by the name of Ashton. This, this I tell you. We sometimes tell the truth around it. This is true. This is true. The company bought a South American parrot and named her Ashton. So they taught her to repeat all the company product lines, put her in a little room, and that was the Ashton of Ashton Tate. <laughs> She'd reel off titles like D Base 2, D Base 3, and so forth. Now, the last I heard, that whole company has been sold to Borland Software. Is that still going, Borland Software down in Austin, Texas? Names do matter. Names make a difference. Jacob gets a new name, and here's the good news. God blesses us in the same way when we struggle with him and finally surrender to his matchless love and say, all right, I give up. You, you're in charge. Here I am, Lord. Use me. And I would suggest that for many of us, the name that we receive is the name Christian. One over whom Christ is Lord. We were having lunch a couple weeks ago with Erin Weil, our new associate. We were continuing her grilling. <laughs> so uh, I think it was my wife asked, uh, so Erin, uh, in a minute, how would you describe a Christian? And she said, I would say a Christian is one who accepts Jesus' offer to follow him. Let's make this journey together. I thought, boy, I think we've got a winner here. We better keep this person. Maya Angelou, the famous poet, puts it this way. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not shouting I'm clean living. I'm whispering I was lost, now I'm bound and forgiven. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not shouting 
Excuse me. When I say I'm a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need Christ to be my guide. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak and need his strength to carry on. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I've failed and need God to clean my mess. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are all too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I am a Christian, I feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not holier than thou. I'm just a simple sinner who received God's grace somehow. The name Christian available to any who would like to embrace the Christian faith. Amen. Now our closing hymn is not the one that's our closing hymn is the one that's listed. It's not the right number, however. So if you'll turn to number 494, 494, you'll find the hymn, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We are pleased that you have joined us for the Sunday morning service from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational congregation. We hope that the music and the spoken word have lifted your spirits and have offered guidance and a sense of direction for your life. Have a wonderful week.